Λοιπόν, είναι μεγάλη μου χαρά να, να κάνω την εισαγωγή για την Παόλα Ανδρεάνη. Είναι η δεύτερη φορά που έρχεται στο Αριστοτέλειο. Είχε έρθει και πάλι πριν την πανδημία και μάλιστα αμέσω μετά την, την επίσκεψή τη είχαμε το μεγάλο κλείσιμο. Λοιπόν, η κυρία Ανδρεάνη είναι ε, ουσιαστικά η, η επιστήμονα που είναι η διευθύντρια στο γραφείο ε, επιστήμης του, του European Southern Observatory του Ευρωπαϊκού Νότου Παρατηρητηρίου. Έχει σπουδάσει φυσική στη Ρώμη και έχει πάρει ε, το διδακτορικό της πάνω σε ο, παρατηρήσεις ε, από την Ανταρκτική για το κοσμικό υπόβαθρο. Λοιπόν, έχει ξοδέψει δύο χρόνια στο Αστροφυσίκ, Ινστιτούτο Αστροφυσίκ και Τεπαρή και ήταν και πόστο με τα δοκτορική ερευνήτρια στο Ίσο. Λοιπόν, επίσης ήταν, κέρδισε την πολύ μεγάλου waitρου υποτροφή Αλεξάνδρου Φον Χουμπολτ στο Max Planck Institute για, για, φυσική, για εξωγήινη φυσική, εξαδρέστερ φυσικ και ήταν... Αναπληρώτητα καθηγήτρια στο Πανεπιστήμιο της Πάντοβα. Και ουσιαστικά είχε και μία ανάμειξη σε όργανα, στο, στο ΠΑΞ όργανο πάνω στο διαστημό πλειο Χέρσελ, διαστημό τηλεσκόπιο στις ψηλέ συχνότητες. Και είναι αυτή τη στιγμή, είχε διατελέσει και σαν διευθύντρια του, του Alma Regional Center στο Ίσο. Λοιπόν, είναι μία επίσης πολύ ενεργή ερευνήτρια και καλή φίλη και είναι χαρά μου να προλογίσω την, ε, την ομιλία της που, έδωσε στο Αριστοτέ, που, έδωσε, που θα δώσω στο Αριστοτέλη. Ευχαριστώ. So we were talking about uh, the countries which are member of ESO. Currently there are 16 member states and the Chile is the host state and then there is a special deal with Australia Uh, Australia is uh, supporting uh, strategic partnerships, so she, they have access uh, to uh, some of the isotelic sources, but in particular those in Paranal and in La Silla. And uh, so uh, I guess so, uh, the ISO Council will be um, happy to, uh, to other countries join, so I'm also here to advertise it for eventually a, a Greek partnership. So they have a several observatories. They started in La Silla, uh, which is thousand kilometers north of Santiago. And then uh, they built another uh, uh, observatories in Paranal, which is even north in north uh, to close to Antofagasta in the Atacama Desert. And then uh, ESO joined the partnership of Apex, which is a single dish, uh, some millimeter, uh, um, instruments and ALMA, which I will briefly talk about. And now this is heavily involved in the construction of the extreme large telescope, which is almost a 40 meter optical, well, near infrared telescope, and is hosting the Cherecon telescope array south in, uh, in Paranal. Um, so now I'm, I'm frozen. Let's see if I can Just, uh, click. Let's click in the slide and I think it will close. <laughs> okay, fine. So uh, this is a, 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 a symbolic map of, of Chile in the southern hemisphere and uh, where you can see where Paranal and Alma are located in the north in the Atacama region. Um, this uh, view of uh, La Silla uh, which is hosted, which were, where all these sort of stories started. So they started with their quite small telescopes uh, paid by the, the several countries. So the Danish, the Swiss, uh, and the, 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 German, the Germans and so on. Now ESO is only operating two telescopes at the NTT, which is here on the right. Then uh, uh, next uh, was at that time next uh, a new technology telescope. It was built in the 80s. And uh, the 360, which is doing really, uh, let's say, very advanced science nowadays, because uh, since uh, 
30 years is hosting instruments discovering planets around uh, nearby stars and that which I mean you I guess you know that the, the two people started these projects were over the Nobel Prize a few a few years ago. Um, this is the uh, a view of Paranal. Paranal hosts four eight meter telescopes which are called UT one, two, three and four. And what's also very interesting, the VLTI, which is an optical interferometer, uh, combining the focus of the foci of the four units, so the four UT, or the four small telescopes that you, which you see here on the, on the foreground, which are 1.8 meter telescopes, which are smaller, but depending on the sensitivity you would like to reach, of course, you combine either the, the small ones or the, or the bigger ones. Um, so they, the, the unit telescopes, the UT, is, uh, as you see, has a mirror, the, the main mirror of 8.2 meter in diameter, has a secondary almost one meter, and that's a third, a, third, a tertiary mirror which allows to host one instru uh, instruments on the Cassegrain uh, focus and two instruments on the NASMIS. Um, on the NASMIS cell. So each unit can host the three different instruments. This is a, a schematic view of Paranal. What I wanted to do just to highlight is that is also hosting two SAVI telescopes, which is called VISTA and VST. VST will be decommissioned, will be, no, not decommissioned, will be returned back to Italy at the end of this year, while VISTA keeps uh, doing the, the service with not updated instruments. So the instruments, they are quite a variety. Uh, not every, uh, all of them are working in, in uh, simultaneously because depending on the science and the scheduling, um, you, you, you may choose one of those depending on, uh, of course, on your size. So on the Cassegrain telescopes is uh, on top. You have a force uh, vizier extruder. Uh, they are all uh, spectral spectrographs as forces a spectral imager which is heavily used so that uh, people are, uh, are very fond of it also because offer polarimetric uh, uh, facilities this is in the near infrared this extruder is in the uh, uh, high resolution spectro spectrograph in their in their visible range then we have UVIS, which is another uh, uh, spect high resolution spectrograph. CRIRES is uh, another in uh, instruments in the near infrared. HOKAI is a, a camera in the near infrared. Then we have SPHERE, which has a coronograph where you can use it to, to block the, uh, the light from the star and look for planets around it. But then we have flames and chemos, uh, which are Camos uh, is um, um, a multi-object uh, uh, spectrograph, an imager that I will go through uh, their um, their um, um, their uh, how do you say uh, characteristics in a while. The, I would just want to highlight that there are other uh, instruments on the building. Uh, usually, how an instrument is built is a a consortium are proposing it where there is a, a defined PI and defined responsibility. Usually at various institutes in the member states uh, putting together and proposing the instruments to ISO. And then it, this is goes through a series of evaluation through the first the scientific evaluation, the scientific impact and so on, then the technical aspect and then of course, the funding aspect, okay? And there is a long negotiation because usually the consortia get guaranteed time observations on that instruments back from ESO. So ESO puts the telescopes and their expertise are, are, are available for, for the consortia, for the, their members. So there are others uh, on the pipeline. So at the end of the day, there's a huge number of, the, of instruments if you see. So 12 plus seven at the, at, the, at the LT, working at 
different wavelengths, going from imaging, coronography, as I said, for the search of planets, single objects, slit spectroscopy, multi-object spectroscopy, IFU, which is the integral field unit, which allows you to have on one shot the image and the spectra of uh, the sources where you're looking at, and then uh, polarimetry. Um, so this is a, a summary, a table which might be useful, where you have for, on the x-axis the resolving spectral power, and on the x-axis the, the wavelength range. So you see, okay, most of course most of the instruments are in the visible and near infrared range. We have a vizier which is having the high resolution, the role resolution. Mode, uh, mode in uh, in spectroscopy at uh, at um, let's say in the near infrared band in the infrared band which is n and q which is up down to 20 micron uh, of course you need a site like paranal which is very very dry to observe at this at this wavelengths otherwise you are completely blind by by the atmosphere um Again, this is another way to see, uh, to, com to combine the instruments in terms of angular resolution, not spectral in this case, against the wavelengths. And then you see there is a, a wide parameter space to uh, which ISO instruments uh, cover. Then, uh, as a, uh, ISO decided to join the, uh, uh, the ALMA, so the Atacama larger than millimeter, millimeter array. Why that? Because this is just to make a, a snapshots uh, of what, what kind of techniques and telescopes we need to have, a, to have various resolution, right? So here below, I'm showing the uh, interferometers, so, so radio, uh, space VLBI, VLTI, so in, uh, in, the, in the optical. And uh, well, you need to go to interferometers really to uh, go to very high spatial resolution. And uh, while the single telescopes, so the VLT that I, I was showing in a second ago, and all the ground based and space telescopes, and this is for reference, so this is the resolution of the human high. So you, you have uh, more or less an overview of why we need to be at interferometers first. And also I put also on top of some of the characteristics, uh, uh, angular um, dimension of different uh, astrophysical sources, right? So from galaxy clusters, which are uh, wide in the sky, so are, are around a uh, uh, few uh, arc minutes, down to, to the black hole that I'm showing in a, in a while. So what? Well, no, no, yes, but I was showing, the, sorry, this is, might be confusing. I didn't, I mean, interferometers are those, yeah, but I, you're right, it's confusing. I should have put it the other way. So this is a view of ALMA. Uh, ALMA uh, is, is at 5,000 meters on the Chanhantor Plateau in the, on the north of Paranal in the uh, close to Bolivia border. ALMA consists of uh, 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 50 12 meter dishes, which are these ones, plus uh, is a compact array in the center, which has uh, 10, 12, 7 meter dishes. Sorry, this is has gone too fast. And um, and uh, which allows uh, to uh, to study the the low spatial um, the the yes the low uh, the the highest uh, largest angular scale, which is complicated in interferometry. And also there are there are some development plan to go up to la uh, baselines which are larger than uh, sixteen kilometers. So at the moment, the largest baseline is sixteen kilometers, which limits the resolution but there are development plans to go to at least 32 kilometers. So you will be able to. So this is just to give you a physical uh, overview of what uh, uh, can be done. What are the physical size of the, in, a, in a, the various frequencies that ALMA can reach. So as, of course, at highest frequency, you can go 
deeper because uh, the resolution is diffraction limited so you can go to a uh, higher uh, higher resolution so smaller angular scale uh, for the for the target sources and i put here some some numbers for the most compact and the most extended configuration in terms of uh, physical size so in parsecs and kiloparsecs for the various frequency so the capabilities of alma this is quite uh, the, the original plan now there are development plants which are mostly uh, working on uh, increasing the the bandwidth so the possibility to observe a large uh, range of frequencies or other at the same time and now you have to tune the receivers on different uh, spectral window to have a wide coverage and frequency you have a question yes yeah i will i will show you some uh, some uh, the results some but uh, yes what we are looking for if for instance uh, one of the no 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 sure that's a very pertinent question sorry maybe i should have started with with uh, science and then with uh, with the instruments i did the other way around but sorry yeah i will show some example of, of recent results which have been taken with vlt vlti and alma uh, surely, what the, the goal of ALMA was when it was built was to look at the cold universe, right? Because the cold means that it emits a, a, a long frequencies. So, uh, sorry, uh, uh, yes, at long uh, sorry, at low frequencies and to a long uh, wavelengths. And, but you have to go to the very high side to have the possibility to observe in this uh, some millimeter region because the atmosphere absorbs most of uh, the, the radiation coming from the uh, celestial source. Uh, interferometry allows you to go to very, very small angular scale. So you, for instance, you can look at the center of galaxies. You can study what's happening at the center of galaxy where we think uh, we are host there, there, there is a black hole there. And so you can study the physics of uh, in the vicinity of the black hole. That's why you need uh, uh, very, very complex instruments like, like this one. So, um, okay, I can skip this. I don't think, I, so I just want to give you a, an overview of the capabilities of ALMA. Uh, nowadays, people are working on increasing the, the band size of the correlator to allow to have uh, um, their uh, snapshots at the larger frequency range. So they, if you have a very, very, for instance, broad uh, line, what, what the, for instance, uh, the AGN emits, you can cover the entire line in one shot instead of tuning the, the various re the receivers in different spectral window to have the entire line emissions. Or if you are studying protoplanetary disk where you see a lot of uh, emission lines in, uh, in, a, in a wide, uh, frequency range you can do in one observation instead of tuning the receiver well, yes yes yeah Be yes sure well okay yes <laughs> maybe that's the next talk i will start with the with the <laughs> with the science what we do is uh, just a brief overview of the uh, extreme large telescope, uh, this, which is under construction. This is a, a recent uh, picture of what is, it looks like now uh, in the in Amazonas, which is close to Paraná. You see the basements there. If you can see, I hope you can see the, the picture. You see the basements of the dome. Okay, I'll show you the, how how wide is that now. Well, it will be. And, um, and they are uh, still first uh, constructing the, the, the host, the, what will host the, the telescope. Uh, of course, in the meantime, they are working on the mirrors and on the structure of the telescope. So the ELT is a 39 meter telescope, okay, which is um, the, at the moment really the largest optical and near infrared telescope. Uh, if the first light is planned for the end of 2027, I hope that this schedule will be maintained. You know, with the pandemic and with the war now in Ukraine, we there are a lot of delays, uh, not only for 
people who cannot work, but also to deliver material to build uh, to build the structure. So it's becoming uh, more challenging, let's say. The construction cost is pretty high, it's 1.3 billion euro. Yeah, at the very beginning when it was approved was 1 billion euro. Uh, there are some in contingency because, as I, as I was mentioned, okay, there were problems with the contractors. So the operations cost will be 50 million euros per year. Anyway, uh, there is an adaptive optics. So the, the, the telescopes looks a bit like this, and it's a 780, I guess, uh, segmented mirror. So we will be put together. And you can imagine what it means to align all these mirrors to get the parabolic structures. We should work at frequency which are very, very high, other we have wavelengths which are very, very small. So the structure should be better than the wavelength you're looking at. Otherwise, you get a, distort, a distorted image of, of the source. Uh, so it look it works with adaptive optic, which means that each mirror has uh, on behind it adapters, mechanical adapters, which you can move with the software and uh, and pistons uh, to adjust the the surface. So it's a very challenging uh, in mechanical instruments. And uh, there are uh, the, the the M1 unit is the one which is has a hole in the center to, to allow. The, the photons to go through the category and uh, it has a diameter of 39 meters and then you see also all the other mirrors are pretty large because the secondary is four meters so it's if you, if you can think about it, it's pretty large the m3 which allows again uh, to have the the, the focus on the nasmith uh, uh, platforms which are the, these platforms that you see on the on the side of the telescope and um, and the and just for an Italian perspective, if you see if you put the Colosseums close to the LT, you see how big is uh, it will be. Um, it's just for fun. This is an artistic view. Uh, okay, I think I can speak uh, skip this, but just to make uh, to compare the size of the ELT uh, primary mirror with what we are we are having on the market at the moment and eventually in the future. Um, this is the giant Magellan telescope, which I think uh, has still problem of being funded. And, uh, and the yeah, 30 meter telescopes, I think uh, uh, you know that they're having problems on, on funding and, and uh, a hosting site. So, uh, but these are put in the context of uh, also um, current uh, uh, current facilities. Um, so, okay, I mentioned the adaptive optics uh, just to give you an idea what it means. So, if uh, uh, on the left there is an HST image, okay, close to a uh, star formation um, um, clumps. This is what you get with the DLT, which is eight meters. It's in the atmosphere, where the HSC is outside the atmosphere, but it has only a 2.5 meter, plus the adaptive optics on the DLT. So you get a better, of course, a better resolution. You can distinguish the, the crowded uh, uh, clusters there, but with DLT and of course it's adaptive optics, you will get uh, this. This is a simulated image, of course, but uh, it'll give you an idea why we need to have uh, such a big beast to observe. So the first light uh, instruments uh, will be the this three, the Mikado, Plasma Ori, Harmony, and Metis. The, uh, the first one is an, Im an imager and a single slit spectrograph. Then the harmony is the integral field spectrograph and made is a mid infrared imager and spectra. So they're all working in the near infrared for the first light. So ELT will uh, shift uh, parad paradigm with respect to uh, what uh, is a uh, uh, paranal providing. I don't want to spend too much time on it, to just give you an overview. Uh, as, I, as I did for the VLT instruments, as you we have uh, wavelengths with respect to uh, resolving power in, so in, in, uh, in 
the uh, spectroscopy. So you see that EFT will be able to observe a very, very high resolution with Hyres and Metis, a mid resolution with Metis and uh, Mikado, and then uh, imaging at, uh, at uh, lower uh, spectral resolution. Uh, just a, a, a word about the, Cheren, the Cherenkov telescope, which is not an ESO instrument, as will be only hosted by ESO because they were looking for a site where to locate this, this antenna. And uh, they were, there was a longer discussion and then they agreed that ESO provides the, the, the land. So they will be there and they will uh, also get some like power and uh, this is a very, very high energy uh, um, facility. It's exploding the cherry of life, produce a very, very high energetic photons through the atmosphere, producing this cascade. And they will have uh, several uh, telescopes of different size, trying to cover a wide range of energy, which in, 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 a, in, a gen uh, in total will have a three kilometers uh, uh, um, area to cover. And uh, just to give you the idea, if we put the, the, the in, uh, in terms of uh, frequency and energy of the electromagnetic spectrum, the, the cherry of light will, uh, will sample the very, very high energy up to 300 tera electron volt. So it's a, it's a very, very high energy. So that's just to make in the context of why you have, you know, or oh, why we, why they are building this one. So ESO has a, 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 a location in Chile, a CLEAR, which is the headquarter to, uh, to operate a telescope there. And this is the Santiago office in, in Santiago. And this is the main uh, headquarters, which is close to Munich in Garchi. Uh, it has a new building, which is uh, this uh, three circle, uh, uh, peculiar form on the on the left, a technical building where, where now the big instruments of VLT are going to be assembled and tested. The old building, which is, was the original one uh, uh, given to Germany uh, from Germany to ESO in the 70s, and the and then there is a visitor center where you see up there with a two. Uh, rounded uh, um, circle with two circles, which are is the, um, let's say, uh, the shape of, uh, of a supernova, of a binary stars, where, and that's why it's called supernova. This was a donation by the Chira Foundation to ESO, and, but now ESO has to operate. So it has a big planetarium in, uh, inside it and uh, a permanent exhibition plus uh, all events and so on. Let's go to, uh, to some uh, uh, scientific uh, <laughs> highlights. <laughs> Why are we building all this, this telescope? Uh, so I, of course, I could not, uh, not mention the Galactic Center because as you know, two years ago, it was uh, received uh, the, a Nobel Prize among the uh, Nobel uh, awardees. Uh, there is Professor Genzel, who has been working with this group a lot on the Galactic Center, proving the, the existence of uh, the black hole at the, at the center of it. So I, I, I took the movie, which is on the MPE website, I hope I can run it, where they show uh, a zoom of the center of the galaxy. The first uh, observations were done with uh, an eye view, so with plus adaptive optics, which was Symphony, and which was, is, was uh, targeting uh, the infrared light because the galactic center is full of dust and, and gas. And so there is a lot of obscurations of the stars. So you cannot observe in the UV and the optical. So they use the infrared light to go uh, down to the center and of course plus the adaptive optics to have a very high resolution um, angular resolution to look at at the measure the motion of the stars around around a very massive object which is at the center of, of it these are the image uh, and uh, as if you can follow the orbits of each stars then with a, let's say 
uh, Newtonian and Kepleperian motion, you can derive the orbits uh, of, the, of the stars and you derive the mass of the galaxy, you know, uh, better than me. And, and, uh, and they uh, were able to see, uh, to measure that there were deviation from uh, Newtonian gravity and to, to check about the relativity um, on top of it. And they could measure the mass of, uh, of, this, or the, of the central object, which is, turns out to one million solar mass. Now, I mean, there, you will hear soon next week uh, more about the Galactic Center because ALMA is, uh, is working on it. See, this were, uh, was the first uh, very, let's say, uh, ground, uh, uh, um, as you say, uh, astonishing in, uh, in picture of, of a black hole, but this was done in a, a nearby uh, galaxy, which has M, uh, radio galaxies with M87. And this uh, image I show you two years ago already, but it's, uh, it's uh, still uh, the, a nice image, which shows also the power of uh, ALMA and APEX in using, in, a, in phasing the uh, Event Horizon Telescope, which is a network of various uh, radio telescopes on the planet, which were uh, observing together and uh, to image their center, the center of uh, M87. And then uh, they, they, <clears throat> they produce that image, which is showing their, um, their synchrotron lights uh, around to the black hole and escaping uh, in, a, uh, um, in a differential way from one side to the other side of the, of the black hole. And it was a very, very nice test of general relativity, of course. Um, then uh, related to black holes, so there are also very nice uh, results. On, on this, this is the VLTI, which as I was mentioning, is the optical interferometer in Paranal. They, they using, uh, they're using both gravity and Matisse, which are the two last instruments, which are the most powerful instruments on the LTI. And they used both instruments here in these cases to image the black holes in the NGC 1068, which is one of the prototype uh, Seifert two galaxy. There were a lot of debates on the, whether there is a torus or not a torus around the black hole. But these uh, uh, people, where there, there is a link, I think, uh, to the Nature article, yes, they were able at least uh, to make a strong case that there is indeed uh, a, a torus of dust around uh, this uh, Seifert two galaxies confirming the idea that the, the various uh, uh, type of EGN that you're observing in the sky are the same population of objects just looked at a different uh, viewing angle. And in this case, we are seeing in this one through the dust. That's why we're seeing, we are not able to see uh, the, the, the broad line region of the, and uh, the accretion disk of the black hole in the center, but we see more outside it. And this was, I mean, it's a 40 years already study, but it was very recent uh, um, addition by, done by the LTI and, uh, and Matisse and Gravi. Yes, to, to explain, yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, thank you, Madalis. Uh, there it was another uh, nice uh, uh, dispute on the uh, in the in the literature among the community. To uh, there were a claim, there was a claim to have seen the closest black holes to, to the solar system. Well, this is a system which consists of uh, 
couple of stars. So it's a binary system where you have a B stars and a BE stars. And there were uh, observations uh, looking at the astrometry of the this, this system and uh, claiming that there was a third companion, which was not visible, okay, which was disturbing and perturbing the, the, uh, the orbits of this binary system. And that's why there was a claim there was a, a black hole in this, uh, in this nearby binary system. So there was a, a lot of discussion on it. This is again another uh, very nice results from uh, uh, gravity and with Muse, which is one of the IFU on, on the BLT. So at, yeah, and uh, but however, it looks like at least the latest uh, uh, report on this, it looks like that the the, the observations are bet, be, at best fit with only two stars, with one of the stars which is a more compact. Uh, and extracting um, material from the other one, and that's why disturbing the 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 the, uh, the system. However, sure, there will be a lot of discussion on top of it. Um, this also is a nice result. So Espresso is a, a high resolution spect spectrograph, which is at the center of Paranal and and takes uh, the lights of four units. It's not an interferometer, so it's not coherent combined. The lights are just edging photons from the four units. So it has, of course, uh, as, it's, as it has had a telescope of 16 meters instead of eight meters. So that's why it's able to, to collect more light. And they are looking at, uh, uh, of course, of, uh, exoplanets, so planets in the nearby stars, and they uh, look. Uh, confirm the presence of the third planet in a Proxima Centauri system. Um, I think, uh, oh, despite I'm not excited personally about finding another planet, uh, but I think it's a very nice result uh, showing uh, the power, the power of, uh, of these instruments, which was originally built to measure the expansion of the universe looking at quasars and uh, for 10 years and looking at the absorption lines of quasars whether in in the in the in time after years they move and then you could derive the hubble expansion and then of course if uh, the universe is expanding differently from what uh, from uh, a friedman model or um then from alma i think one of the nice results is Despite I'm not an expert on it, and I found it, I'm not sure that this is really, uh, <laughs> it's, a, it's an outstanding result, but that people claim it is. So they have looked at a star forming region nearby. It's a large program on ALMA, so it means uh, many, many hours of observations. They were measuring the, the, the mass of all these clumps in this star forming region believing that each clump gives origin to a star. So making this assumption that, and then counting the, uh, the stars, counting the mass, of course, um, um, evaluating the mass of, their, of their each clumps and claiming that the initial mass function, which is a, a parameter which is widely used in astronomy, uh, to uh, think about how star formation processes are, are happening, it's different than what uh, people were believing until now. But if this is true, I cannot say because they are measuring clumps and not stars, and they are assigning a mass to a star derived from the dust mass. So, of course, there are a lot of assumptions there, but but at least maybe you know better than me about it. Okay. And then another nice observation, recent observations of ALMA is that they, uh, okay, ALMA can do a lot of astrochemistry, which is wonderful. Uh, and this is one of the largest molecules measured in a nearby system, which uh, is a D-methyl ether. Uh, which is one of the prototype of amino acids. So that's why there is a lot, there were a lot of press release claiming that this, 
we are discovering the origin of life uh, in uh, a nearby system. But of course, uh, from here to the DNA and the RNA, there is uh, still a big step. But uh, it's nice that we are seeing these uh, complex, complex molecules uh, in, in uh, space. And all this. Uh, then, just a few words about ESO and being a student at ESO. ESO is hosting uh, quite a number of uh, young people. Uh, we have for uh, aging fellows, so each year, not higher each year, but in total, uh, and 25 PhD students plus uh, several visitors and so on. So uh, it's, uh, there is a possibility to apply either to uh, get a PhD position for three or three and a half years, at ESO, we can only host four full PhD per year, but we have also the possibility to host the students who are already enrolled at one of the university worldwide, and they can apply for a studentship and come to ESO for one or two years during their PhD project. Otherwise, we also have projects like Padelis and I, we have a, a possibility to host the students for a given project for two, three, four, six months and uh, coming to work on a specific project so, so, so to get uh, familiar with astronomical observations. That's the major idea because we are an observatory, so we are not doing theory, but we are uh, giving the possibility to students to uh, have hands on, on data of various types. You see, we have a big uh, archive and a big uh, possibility. And uh, of course, so this is just to advertise. We have, a, um, we offer a, a, a packet to, to the students which are quite attracting, okay. Uh, then the, uh, another advertisement is uh, to get uh, ESO uh, um, the telescope time. And uh, there is a full uh, department supporting uh, uh, ast uh, astronomers who wish, wish to submit a proposal, to submit uh, a project, in, a research project. And uh, this is just uh, to give you an overview and uh, to give you a schema how uh, you get uh, uh, support while proposing. So when you write a proposal, you may get support from staff at ESO. Then once uh, your proposal will be accepted, uh, you will get support to prepare actually the observations, which are, uh, of course, there is a software ad hoc to per instruments. So, and then you need to tune uh, your uh, parameters, so the grading, the resolution, the, the, the spectral resolution, how you want uh, the sensitivity and all this stuff, but you will get help from this. And then finally, once the data are, are taken and in Chile, they will be ingested in the archive. And once after 12 months, the data will be public. So there is a huge archive, which is hosting observations from almost 60 years and uh, and of course all the observations there might be obsolete for those who are not doing uh, transients but there are uh, still a lot of uh, very very good data which could be which could be um, useful there there is uh, a portal a science portal where you will find all this information that i try to communicate today and where you find both information on the instruments, both information on the proposals, on uh, and all um, on the preparation of observations and all this. And this similar is happening for Alma. Alma has used the same portal, but of course it's targeted to a different community. Okay, preparing observations for Alma, but the the flow is very very similar. And uh, what else I would like to do? Yes, the Science Archive, I mentioned many times, but I think uh, it's, uh, it's worth to look at the, uh, the, uh, the archive. There, is a, there are a lot of data which are already science ready because uh, ESO has a team uh, and also working with the community to ingest uh, catalogs of uh, sources which have been taken with, uh, with surveys and so, or other facilities and also they are re-reducing 
data and ingesting the in the archive data which are already reduced it means that the all the calibration and the instrumental uh, affecting the observations are considered and taken out and then you can use the data uh, in practice uh, to interpret the data and use it for your science goal and i think i i can stop this and eventually i'm happy to have questions from from yeah I stop share. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, first of all, thank you very much for this excellent overview. Yeah. Of Hebrew and uh, science and instruments. Uh, could you go back? Let me show one slide where you compare the, the images from SSD, DLP. Ah, yes. Uh, wait a second. I, I need it. Uh, yes. Okay, now I hope I get it. You mean uh, this one, right? Yeah. Yes, yes. So my question is the following. Uh, between HST yes. and, and DLT with adaptive optics, we can see a huge improvement. So it's like order of microphone. Yes. Uh, now, the expected improvement with DLT compared to the DLT uh, appears like an incremental yes. improvement, uh, at, at least for certain five sources. But I assume that for, for fame sources, the, the advantage of DLT would be much larger than, than uh, in this example. Yeah, well, this example is indeed the dynamic range here is pretty large. Yes. So it, it and it will saturate immediately the DLT instrument. Yes, you're right. So it's a pretty complicated. I think the, the aim of this picture was to show how you may distinguish your, your stars in, in, a, in a cluster in this case. But I agree with you, yes, the, the real advantage will be when you are targeting very faint sources. Yeah. Yes. Any question about the account organization of the work for the special students? That's, it's important, I think, to say that if this becomes a member, then it will be much better wider access to students and postdocs and research. Right now, it's the only special program that you want to have. Yeah. I have a technical question. Uh, do you design the cool generation? Who operates those machines? So this is a lack of technicians who know how to operate the machines. Uh, it's a combination. Uh, originally, ESO, when, when it was built 60 years ago, they had all the expertise to build instruments in-house. Now, with it becoming so large, it is impossible. So they are delegated to consortia of people with institutes and their industries to build the, the instruments. And ESO does of mostly the supervision, but in some cases also building some part of the instruments. So, but in the read, yes, in the, for the last 10 years in practice, it's, it's all outsourced, let's say, but of course to community with people with, are uh, made of scientists and engineers together. Plus in the sites that got approved, but actually month does with these telescopes, especially if they have also the specialists, but they will have to operate these telescopes. Sure. So this is not only large number, it's the or even masters, as I think, which is simply technical people. Actually, this is a majority, probably. The majority, make yes. all this work, right? We sit, you know, on the, on the form of it all. So it's important to know that even software specialties, electronic specialties, simply hands-on people can actually work there. They don't have to be 
The, yeah, of course, in Paranal, in, in Chile, there are the people running the show, okay? So they know how to not only to put a telescope on the, uh, put the instruments at the focus of a telescope, but how to uh, illuminate, how to make in focus, how to operate, uh, and how to do the, the first maintenance, okay? At least the ones which require just a screwing, uh, a screw or, but of when there is a big uh, maintenance because you have to replace a mirror or you have to replace a component then requires uh, there that you work together with a, the, eventually with a consortia of the consortia has delegated completely ISO. There will be ISO engineers doing this. It's a complex machine, but it's very, very uh, interesting. I think at, at all level, okay? Because I, the people I, I I work with are very happy, even if they were only the technical people doing the cryostat, very happy to work, to work for a scientific big goal. Okay? Or this, you know, I think it's a, it's a nice opportunity for, for many, many people. And in particular, now we are looking for mechanical engineers. There are not many on the market. So it looks like <laughs> there are not many. And to build a telescope, you need a mechanical engineer, both to, to build the dome and to build the, the structure and so on. Yeah, the operating room for most of the telescope is a, you know, almost like a mission control of space cars. So you have a lot of people working there, mm. three, four, five people simultaneously monitoring the various systems. It's at least to make it run. It's not like, okay, this is my object, and I go and look at it with my spectrum. There's many people that have to make each component work, monitor it, and it, it runs because of the enthusiasm and technical capabilities of a lot of people. Mm. So, can you go back to the, the, the event horizon picture? Yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah, let's see what we see uh, on uh, uh, Thursday. <laughs> so, yeah, so if it was a Colombo and Apex, that's the picture that was released, the one to the right, which is not, I mean, so people will put the data reduction and they will do the models. The black hole is still there with the picture to the right. But public relation wise, it's very difficult. Yes. In the, in the yes. front page of every newspaper, yes. <laughs> if you want to show the one on the right, look, there's a black hole in the center, right? You know, but this one, because it adds this sensitivity and phase stability, the phase referencing makes it possible to really uh, make uh, the free transfer of this data give you your design details. It was one of the most international collaborations in the mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Uh, can we get a small spoiler for next week? Or no, I don't have it. I'm <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I, no, really, they are really, really, really. <laughs> but I, I don't have any. I'm, I swear, I don't have anything. I know. I, was, I knew only that there is a press release. They are looking. They are talking about the Galactic Center. I know that it was a very long uh, to reduce the data from the Event Horizon Telescope for the Galactic Center because the black holes is one mil, uh, one thousand times less massive than that in M87, this one in M87, and it has a lot of variability. So you you have not only to face uh, the the various telescopes, but take care that the facing is correct and it's not due to variable source. So I, I know that it take it took a long time. I'm sure that it will show something on the galactic center, eventually a better picture because the, the resolution is better being closer, but it can also correlate the most of the stuff Yeah, that's, that's the thing, right? Because this is a more transit source. It's, it's not a steady state charge. No. So one of the basic principles in the front it breaks down, which is while you observe it, the source is the same. You can say that for the center, but you can't say that for the galactic center. So it just kind of adds all the data in one big fully transfer image. You have to be able to take into account that the galactic center changes, and you should take that into account as you go out. But we do have a guide that has started.
Huh? The no, well, they are self referencing. Right? Well, this is self referencing in the radio wavelengths. Stars are not a very good source, so you can't use any kind of stuff. There's no such a thing as a kind of star in radio. So, what they do, they could be a bright spot of the source itself, like a central trunk, or it could be there, and you use that as self reference your face to make what we call self reference. Okay. If there isn't one, then they have to do all sorts of other techniques. They have to go back to a nearby source, which is a crater. But this is case that is strong enough to self reference. So, all right, so if okay. you have any more questions, uh, let's uh, say Paolo once more. Yes, thank you. And she considers it sympathetic in the Salonique.